Welcome to the Chemilite webinar that take a comprehensive look at the artificial lift and production chemicals market. My name is David Batt, president of Kimberlite Research, and I'm glad you can join us today. I'm accompanied by Andrew Thornton with Kimberlite Research, and together we'll take you through our 33rd Kimberlite webinar. Thank you to the many oil and gas operators worldwide who participate in the Kimberlite industry surveys and studies. In past webinars, we've addressed the global drilling services market, hydraulic fracturing, perforating, and, most, and we've also covered a comprehensive review of the big four oil field service providers, SLB, Halliburton, Baker, and Weatherford. Let us know if you or your colleagues would like access to one of these prior webinars. Just send us an email or a chat message and we'll, we'll get these over to you. Today, we'll be taking a look at the artificial lift and production chemicals market, including updates on technology trends, as well as an overview of the competitive landscape of how the various service suppliers, both large and small, stack up in terms of performance, service quality across various geographies and customer groups. Feel free to submit questions during the webinar and in, in the chat box or email, and we'll, we'll answer your questions uh, during the presentation. For those of you that are less familiar with Kimberlite Research, I will provide a brief background and then we'll dive in to the artificial lift and production chemicals. Each year, Kimberlite conducts voice of customer research. We interview about 3,000 users globally each year. And over the most recent years, we've interviewed over 18,000 users of oil field services and have amassed over 800,000 performance ratings on supplier on suppliers to, perform, uh, to provide our analytics. Our research covers the span, talking to ge geologists and drilling engineers, subsea completion and production engineers. Today, we'll be focusing on artificial lift as well as production chemicals. The findings that we'll be sharing with you today are based on interviews with 370 production engineers and managers from over 200 oil companies globally. And the performance trends that we'll be sharing with you today are based on interviews with over 3,000 production engineers and managers and over 120,000 performance ratings. The data set is rich and multidimensional. And in this exhibit, we cross plot supplier performance on the horizontal x axis versus oil field service company supplier performance and uh, pricing strategies on the y axis. We'll be using this value map quite a bit today, so I'll explain the four quadrants and dive in. Based on operators and customer reviews, any oil field service company that plots in the top right is viewed as a premium supplier, costs more but worth it. The fair value fairway runs diagonally down to the southwest quadrant. Any oil field service company supplier plotting down here is viewed as a discount provider, may not perform on par with industry norm, but offers attractive pricing to where call, you get what you pay for. Bottom right, any oil field service company supplier in the bottom right is value advantage. And any supplier that plots in the top left, their value proposition is being challenged in the eyes of the customers and needs to either put in place a performance improvement plan or perhaps maybe reevaluate their pricing strategies. For the oil and gas operators that are on the webinar today, one of the things we want, really wanna emphasize with you today is you're going to see that you have many choices in artificial lift and production chemicals. And each of the suppliers have distinctive strengths and weaknesses. And so when you're looking for best value, we really ask you to collaborate with your oil field service company suppliers, learn the strengths and weaknesses, and, and, and take that into consideration with your applications and your needs so that you can identify best value for your organization. With that, we'll go ahead and dive in. And I think to maybe kick things off, Andrew, what can you tell us about the markets and perhaps any insights in particular with artificial lift and production chemicals with respect to spending, maybe pricing trends or anything else you've seen out there? Sure. No, thank you very much, David. Um, excited about uh, digging into this one. So we asked the open-ended question, you know, do you expect your expenditures next year, next year for artificial lift to increase, decrease, stay the same? And this is the results we're seeing is that Majority of the market is anticipating an increase in expenditure for artificial lift next year, um, giving us a diffusion index of 76 worldwide. Just for reference, anything above 50 would equal growth year over year. 
And you can see it's a very strong diffusion index. Everything's above 70 and international land in particular, high up 90, 82% of the respondents think expenditure is going to increase. So wow. significant growth expected in that market. Um, I like to look at this trended over time just to kind of see the ebbs and flows. Mm -hmm. um, and what we can see here is that, you know, the depths of COVID in 2020, even then artificial lift as a market state, okay, it's a little bit like a shock absorber, um, a little bit <laughs> as it were. Um, but North America land comes down, right. increases significantly through 21 and 22. It's still growing in 2023. That much is clear, but the rate of growth has slightly plateaued, um, but still strong. Right. International land, as we just saw, is really going to drive uh, overall expansion. I really like this one, and, and it kind of helps to explain the different uh, strategies of uh, some of the oil-filled service companies in terms of their portfolios. That shock absorber, as it were, for artificial lift and chemicals, you can see in the depths of COVID, it doesn't contract quite as much as maybe drilling and completions. It doesn't ramp up quite as fast in 21 and 22, but now we're getting into 2023 and we're seeing the artificial lift in chemicals next year is actually supposed to exceed growth of uh, drilling and completions overall. So if you're in that business, uh, should be a strong year is what we're seeing right now. Do you think with the high oil prices that maybe the focus on production maximization during this period could be driving that a little bit? I think so. I think it's it's going to be an interesting one to see. You know, we may well see some more drilling and completion activity pick back up again. But ultimately, production optimization is going to be critical going forward, particularly as right. in North America as we start to step out into maybe that tier three acreage, so to speak. Okay. Um, how do you turn that uh, acreage that's a uh, sixty dollar break even into a forty dollar break even? Production optimization is a a great way to look at, it. and I think you've got some stuff later on to talk to that. Um, in terms of drilling activity and expectations overall, we're still seeing a very strong market going into next year, about 6% growth. Um, again, international land and then offshore driving the overall activity. U.S. land in Canada growing, uh, maybe not at the 30% rates we've seen for the past couple <laughs> of years, uh, but still growing at, at a decent clip at 29 and 7% respectively. Now, pricing. <laughs> How often do I get uh, questions on pricing? It would be at least twice a day and uh, five times on Sunday. Overall, pricing is anticipated to increase across markets next year for artificial lift. And, and some of our previous webinars, we saw a little bit of a different uh, perspective. But even North America, 3% increase, international land, 6 to 7 and offshore, 6%. So operators are still going to continue to invest in production maximization, as it were. Now, Chemicals, same story, actually. 3% growth in North America land, 8% international, and 5% offshore. So overall, wow. artificial lift and production chemicals businesses in terms of pricing looks relatively uh, strong going into next year. Indeed. Now, back to one of my favorite subjects around overall activity and drilling and rig counts and all those kind of components. As we saw for the past couple of years, this 30% on average growth for the past two years, that's turning into about 1% growth this year, 3% on the drilling side. But again, we anticipate production related expenditure, artificial lift and chemicals to be maybe a little bit ahead of these uh, overall lines. Okay. And in terms of rig count, well, this is an interesting one. We've shown it a couple of times. We do anticipate the rig count in lower 48 to go back above 700 in 2024. But why isn't it going to be 800, 900, 1,000, 2,000, 4,000? We've talked a little bit about this. The amount of production we're getting on a per well and a per rig basis is increasing. And I think artificial lift and chemicals has a lot to, to do with that. David, we've seen in previous webinars the increase in lateral length, in horsepower, in profit usage. We've talked about the technology that's being put into those markets and drilling equations. Right. We've not talked a lot about production optimization in terms of technology and efficiencies. So what are you seeing in, in that regard? And, and what's the potential long-term trend to help this uh, rig count not spike up to 2,000, 3,000 again? Sure, sure. And, and and you're right. I mean, to your point, due to the drilling and completion efficiencies that we are achieving in U.S. land in particular, um, we're able to accomplish more with less. Mm -hmm. We don't need 4,000 drilling rigs to produce 13 million yeah. barrels of oil a day. We can do it today with six, 700 drilling rigs. Um, the production segment, 
is coming around. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think it's lagging quite candidly yeah, behind drilling and completions. Uh, what we found in the 23 report is that the use of automation and artificial lift remains higher in North America land than it does internationally and mm -hmm. offshore. But when we asked the oil and gas operators, where would you like to see improvements in automation and improvements? You know, it's an open-ended question. They speak freely. But when we read through their commentary, you know, they're talking about the use of, you know, predictive analyses, improved real-time communication systems. So there is a clear desire mm -hmm. to want to have the finger on the pulse, what's going on at the pad and the wellhead. We also find that when you look at gas lift systems, which continues to be, you know, a growing area, more and more oil and gas operators are wanting to install downhole pressure and temperature gauges to optimize the productivity of those systems. And we're also noticing in the production chemical space that particularly in North America land, a lot of the operators are using chemical injection pumps to periodically dose the well mm. rather than take the weekly or the biweekly or monthly milk run. And we're also finding, though, that only a third, roughly, of the oil and gas operators have real-time remote visibility as to what's going on with those chemical injection pumps. Now, on the surface, that may not sound like a big deal, but when you look a little bit more deeply, you'll notice that these chemical pumps tend to fail on an average of about 18.6 months. You have a little bit more than half of the users experiencing failures within a year, and these are the reasons why they fail. But what's most intriguing and most powerful is when these chemical pumps last longer than 24 months between failure, so you have an MTBF of greater than 24 months, the runtime of the artificial lift systems are longer by 20, 30%. Mm -hmm. So when these chemical pumps are failing, it's impacting the well's productivity. And if they really want to maximize production optimization, yeah. I, you know, I think we're going to see a trend of more and more operators wanting to have real-time visibility. I think you're going to see improvements in technology around chemical pumps to improve the reliability, because the longer we can push out the MTBF of these chemical pumps, the more that we can improve production optimization and the runtime of the lift systems. And just one more thought as it relates to technology. Mm -hmm. You know, we track ESG sentiment and we know that this is rolling over and we talk about it a lot. But most of the operators focus, particularly in U.S. land, is around emissions monitoring and reduction. And that's creating a whole nother avenue of production technology uh, opportunities, if you will, yeah. for suppliers and operators. And when we ask the oil and gas operators which suppliers really best positioned to help them meet their ESG objectives, SLB continues to stand on top, followed by a host of others. So that's some of the key things that we're seeing in the automation technology trends. Interesting. I guess, Andrew, to kind of look at it, you know, the market for artificial lift has changed so much from the good old days when we would drill, complete a well, put it on a beam pump and walk away. Can you maybe just update us on what forms of lift are the most preferred by the oil and gas operators today and any other trends that you're seeing in the market that you think would be good for everyone to hear? Yeah, absolutely. And it's it's a really interesting area. It's like there is not one form of lift, there is multiple. And how are they translating? Um, long story short, yeah. <laughs> share of wells and artificial lift, there's a lot. A lot of <laughs> there's wells. A lot of wells, um, particularly here in North America, uh, where you've got lower downhole pressure, obviously that's naturally going to create more types of lift being used in a higher penetration this is probably one of the my favorite uh, charts we put together in our most recent report in terms of of those wells that are on artificial lift and there's a lot of them you know what percent is rod versus esp versus gas lift and plunger pcp jet pump you can see here in us land last year about over 50 percent of the wells were on rod lift 16 percent esp and 14 percent gas now look year over year how that's starting to change. Yes, rod lift is is huge, and we'll and we'll talk about that in a second as to why that is. But the growth in ESP in this market as a percentage of the install base in a growing market as well, and the growth of gas lift at the same time is pretty significant. It wasn't that long ago, Andrew, where 
on the installed base, Rodliff made up 70 plus percent of the installed base mm -hmm. and ESP only made up 10%. Yep. And now you're saying they're making up 20% of the market for ESPs. It's almost doubled in the last eight, nine years. It, it's it's really significant. A lot of it obviously comes down to the amount of new wells we're drilling. Obviously, right. Rodlift can be using a lot of old wells. And as we talked, we hinted to earlier, those longer laterals, those bigger propent loads, those bigger well wars, they need bigger ESPs. Uh, they need a little bit more lift and help. And so we're starting to see that higher adoption. Um, you're also seeing that in the in the gassier place. We've got a lot of um, excess gas, shall we say, in North America. So that's being put to use in gas lift as well. well. What do they like to start with when they first put a well on production? So this is a depends on the basin and depends where you're at. Right. But what we did is we we broke this down to, okay, if you use one type of lift, what are you going to use? Well, by and large, you're going to use rod lift, you know, nearly two thirds of the time, gas lift, ESP. That's your, your preference if you're going to use one type of system. But that's only about, you know, under one fifth of the operators we spoke to. Right. 60% of the people we spoke to use two systems. They're going to start off with ESP or gas lift, right. and then eventually they're going to transition to rod. Um, similar for those who use a free systems, ESP into gas lift, into rod. Obviously, plunger lift has a role to play there as well. By and large, you're probably going to, your well's going to die on, on rod most of the time, um, but there's some examples. Now, that does change, though, by basin. The Permian looks very similar to the U.S. land average. So ESP is bigger. ESP is bigger. Um, that is where we're really starting <laughs> to step out uh, in terms of those uh, those longer laterals, and those big right. propent loads. But if we say go to the Barkin, which if you remember used to be, you know, purely rod lift country for the most part, right. we're now starting to see a higher adoption of ESPs in that market. Um, but pretty much a straight up fight ESP onto rod, or if you're going to go for a free system, gas to ESP, wow, 50% time, then straight on onto rod. That's striking with the gas lift because that was something that they normally would not use in the Bakken. So that's all relatively new as well. It is. And you've also got some flaring issues when it comes to gas as well. So that's, that seems yeah. like a smart way to use the actual gas. Uh, True. Eagle Foods, very different, actually. If we look at this, the plunger lift suddenly pops up as a, as a lift system that we've not seen in the previous right. two markets. That's kicking in there as the primary use as a one lift system. Um, gas lift, notice that ESPs is a lot smaller in this overall market. Gas lift, again, Eagle Foods, depending on where you are, right. wet yep. gas, dry gas, or, or liquids. The Rockies... So that's another plunger lift starting to come. Plunger to big there. Plunger's big there. Rod lift again. And we see this. Why is rod lift 50% of the install base? It's being used in some way, shape, or fashion mm -hmm. across the life cycle of the well. Sure. Um, the key is obviously if you can surprise, supply all of these types of lift and be able to really offer your customer a variety of, of options, you're going to be well positioned. Um, Mid-continent. Slightly different again. So every basin has its own kind of niche in terms of how it likes to get uh, the liquids to the surface. When we look at it in totality and the kind of demand, as it were, and the number of installs, again, we see rod lift is, is obviously up here. It's somewhat plateaued, but still holding strong at just over 7,500 installs. Um, then you've got the ESP, the red line, that's shown a significant increase. We saw that 10% adoption rate all the way up to 20% has overtaken gas lift in terms of installs, but gas lift also growing at the same time. Plunger lift and jet lift, relatively steady, but they have their place to play within the overall market. And then of course, when you translate that into market size, it's a question we get, you know, how big is this market? Look at the ESP market at a little over 12, you know, 1.2 billion in 2020, 3.2 billion in 2024. <laughs> Um, significant significant growth. so it, obviously it's a lot more expensive that's what's driving that overall rod lift again also strong growth sure in terms of you know and i like to touch a different components we talked a little bit esps let's talk about sucker rods and all those components interestingly enough a few years ago it was kind of like it's always going to be new rods and used rods is a bit niche right. a bit you know we're still seeing that a large proportion of the sucker rods are, are used in uh, the marketplace. And again, depending on where you're at, pretty significant. Permian, 35%. Another interesting one is, you know, using unit surface units. Is it new? Is it 
in house? Is it a used unit? There's a place to play for everything, depending on what your business mix is and your customers. And that's really important, understanding what your customer prefers and why. Mean time between ESP failure. Again, we talked about production op optimization. How much does it cost if an ESP suddenly fails? That mean time between failure has crept up a little bit in our most recent survey, but you know, still potentially some opportunity there right. to grow for on, on overall reliability. Um, and then finally, when it comes to improvements, what we're looking for improvements, <laughs> as we just see, the mean time is, is kind of steady, improved pump life and reliability as we start to really push these things further and further. So sure, that's kind of the, tr the overall market trends in artificial lift, an awful lot going on there. Um, but David, based on the most recent customer interviews and given all of that information, what are you seeing in the competitive landscape for artificial lift? And how's this going to you know, impact operators finding the best value? Sure, sure. You know, when we talk to the oil and gas operators around the world and we collect their feedback as to how the various suppliers are performing on artificial lift, for those of you that may be new to Kimberlite, when we interview the operators, we generally will ask them an open-ended question. Different suppliers they can mm -hmm. go to. They have lots of choice. And so, you know, we'll ask the oil and gas operators if they use rod lift, who do they use for sucker rides or for downhole pumps? If they use ESPs, who do they use for mm -hmm. ESPs? If they use gas lift, who, which suppliers are they using for gas lift? And what percent of your business goes to whom so we can look at distribution of spend? But really the most important area that we're capturing is we capture from the customer's point of view, the operator's point of view, how the suppliers are performing mm -hmm. on a scale of one to 10 with 10 being excellent performance and one being very poor performance on these, set, on these performance measures. How responsive are they to your needs? Equipment quality and reliability, competency of the field service personnel, technical support, availability, in this case, overall sucker ride performance, mm -hmm. pricing competitiveness. And you see, we, we 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 receive quite a range of ratings. And you know, the ratings can span from one to ten. But when you begin to objectively benchmark this in this particular trend tile, even though this is for uh, sucker rides, the average ratings are you know 8.3, stepping up to about 8.4, but relatively steady. And if you look at the average ratings of the suppliers, you find that, you know, th there's a variance. Not all suppliers are performing at the same level. Some perform better on reliability. Some perform better on being customer responsive. When you move to like ESPs here, the average ratings are down in the sevens. So the average performance review ratings that we're receiving for ESPs mm -hmm. are not as high is what we would see, say, for rod lift. Yeah. Or what we would actually maybe see for gas lift, who's back in the eights. So when we translate this over to the competitive landscape, in this case for sucker rides at North America land level, we, what we find is that Champion X, Endurance, and TRC are viewed as some of the more value advantage suppliers. Mm -hmm. Weatherford's value proposition is about on par with industry expectations, just slightly below expectations. And Lufkin's performance uh, has declined in the 23 report mm -hmm. versus 22. When you look more closely at the performance trends, you're seeing some declines with Lufkin and in, in, uh, in quality of equipment and availability and, and customer support levels. When you move internationally, the comparative landscape shifts that again. Shifts significantly. You've got Champion X and Tenaris viewed as value advantaged. You've got Weatherford over here as a very viable discount provider. And again, Lufkin is exhibiting some competitive challenges relative to the other alternatives in the market from the customer's point of view. When you move to downhole pumps, we find that Liberty Lift, um, who recently acquired Elite Lift up in the Bakken, albeit you know a little bit geographically you know uh, restrictive and where they mm -hmm. operate. Viewed very well based on customers. You'll find Lufkin, Q2, and Endurance viewed as value advantaged. Champion X is more of the premium supplier. Weatherford, Weatherford's uh, pricing strategies are nearly on par with industry expectations. Mm -hmm. Service and support levels, though, continue to lag the industry standard. When you move internationally, however, Weatherford moves into a premium location, mm. along with Champion X and SLB, and Lufkin is competitively disadvantaged. 
when you look at surface units, the beam pump units, and you just cited that only one in three of these beam pump units are sold new, but of the roughly 2,000 units that are sold annually in North America land, Liberty Lift is the leader in terms of sales, but in terms of value, value. Liberty continues to lead along with Lufkin because a large part of the surface unit business these days is service and support mm -hmm. of that huge installed base that you spoke of earlier. 50% of the wells out there are on a beam pump unit. Weatherford is competitively disadvantaged in North America land, but still a very significant supplier for beam pump units in North America land. Internationally, SOB and Weatherford are the premium suppliers, and, and Lufkin becomes the discount provider for a beam pump unit. Transitioning to the ESP market, and given the significance of the ESP market, nearly $3 billion in size, when you first look at this on the surface, you go, wow, there's not much difference in Very performance. Very tight clustering that. But when you start to look into the data set a little bit more closely, like by the Permian Basin, here you start to see some variance. Mm. You know, Valiant, who's very Permian focused, used to be value advantage. Their performance declined, and now uh, Valiant is a discount provider. Extract continues to be a value advantage supplier, mm -hmm. and that's fairly consistent year on year for extract. But when you look into the Permian Basin operators that have a really high number of ESP wells in operation, and they need a supplier who has scale and scope to be able to support their operations, mm -hmm. because when a well's down at $90 oil, yeah, <laughs> that's some uh, monetary value being lost there. Right. The cash register is closed, and they don't like to keep that closed. Mm -hmm. And so you can see that these operators in the Permian lean very, very heavily on the Baker Hughes's and the Halliburton's and the Champion X's, not so much on the smaller ESP suppliers. And if you're an oil and gas operator, you know, for oil and gas operators that really value performance and technology, this is really where Baker Hughes and Halliburton stand out. If you're really focused on the lowest price, that's where companies like Endurance and Extract begin to stand out. For those that are looking for quality service, we see differentiated value amongst operators that value service. And so you can see pay more, get more, or pay less, get less. As you move around from mid-continent where Halliburton uh, is really exhibiting some competitive strengths or in the Bakken where Baker Hughes has competitive strengths, the bottom line is as you move around, Different oil field service company suppliers have different strengths and weaknesses yeah. for a variety of reasons. Mm -hmm. For the oil and gas operators, we really encourage you to collaborate with your suppliers. You have many options, and those options and those suppliers have many different strengths and challenges, like every business. The operators are challenged, too. Some operators may need help with technical support. Others don't need help with technical support. Others need great quality service to handle their 500 wells on the ESPs. What are you trying to achieve? And, you know, what are your challenges and who is going to be the best partner for you to address all of that? Exactly. Turning internationally, you see a very normal differentiated market. SOB, premium supplier. You've got Lavare, formerly Barrett's, um, and, you know, as a discount provider. Al Karif, very local to the Middle Eastern region. They, you know, they tend to be viewed the low price mm -hmm. provider. Offshore, it's really toe-to-toe. -to -toe. Baker Hughes and SLB viewed as the two premium suppliers in the market. Looking at gas lift in United States land, we find that Champion X and Liberty Lift have really, their, their customer reviews improved in the 23 report. Mm -hmm. Floco and Priority continue to stand firm and solid as delivering really strong value and good performance that's better than industry average. Again, Weatherford's pricing is on par with industry expectations, but service and support levels continue to lag. When you move internationally, however, you see Weatherford viewed in a very advantageous position mm. to benefit from that international growth that yep. you just cited at the beginning of the webinar. So Weatherford's really poised to grow and benefit um, internationally. SOB's the premium supplier, and Baker Hughes is exhibiting a little bit of vulnerability and their value propositions being challenged slightly and internationally. And when you go offshore, again, Weatherford's poised to benefit from this growth internationally and offshore. Again, SOB's in their usual position, cost more, but worth it as a premium supplier. Mm -hmm. Baker exhibits some vulnerabilities in the gas lift market offshore. 
Plunger Lift, Floco and Champion X really stand out. Epic is uh, underperforming, but pricing is not that far off from industry expectations. When you go to progressing cavity pumps, this is another area where Weatherford, Champion X, and PCM really stand out and differentiate themselves from the market. When, when you move internationally for uh, progressing cavity pump drive heads, again, you see Weatherford, PCM, and Champion X distinguished as really strong values. SLB, former Kudu uh, organizations, being a bit challenged mm -hmm. in their value proposition based on customer reviews. Ride Strings, company called Lifting Solutions, based out of Canada, really distinguishes himself. Weatherford's well positioned as a premium supplier, along with SLB, Champion X positioned as a discount provider. Internationally, you see Weatherford again, very well positioned to benefit. Mm -hmm. Champion X, solid performance. SLB, Kudu, a bit uh, disadvantaged there. In the wrap it up with downhole pumps, again, Weatherford looking really strong and good. Lifting Solutions, very strong and good as well. SLB, this is a good spot for them. Um, and then if we take a look at downhole pumps um, internationally, PCM looks good. Champion X, the premium supplier. Weatherford and Niche, Niche very, very solidly positioned. So if I were just to sum it up to the oil and gas operators, you have over 80 different suppliers to choose from mm -hmm. for artificial lift globally around the world. The big four, so to speak, these big four integrated suppliers make up less than 50% of the market. Mm. And so it really requires the operators to do their due diligence. Uh, I think this slide kind of points it out the most. There's a whole host of suppliers in here that from an oil and gas operator's perspective, you really want to lean into and understand the strengths and weaknesses. Certainly the SLBs and, and Bakers and Weatherfords have tremendous scale and scope and the ability yeah. Um, some of them are a bit more restrictive in that they focus on ESPs, which tends to be a really uh, difficult application that they're placed in in yeah. many cases. And so, power to leap over. E exactly. Now, Andrea, I know we recently published the production chemicals report. Uh, can you maybe take us through that landscape real quick? And what yeah. are you seeing in that segment? Absolutely. Let's, uh, let's get into it very quickly here. So, you know, Interestingly, you, you know, you showed this exhibit earlier for artificial lift. Now we're looking at, you know, production chemicals, oil filled chemicals. You actually notice that the, the market in terms of overall trends is improving, like responsiveness, yeah. 7.9, we're up to an 8.4. And there are certain opera, you know, service companies who are going with the market or growing ahead of it, like JCAM Catalyst here right. in the light green, and some who are being challenged a little bit in the eyes of the users we spoke to, such right. as Halliburton, um, is seeing a slight decline year over year. Similar trend on product quality. The market is expanding. Can you keep up with the pace of the of the improvement? Shall we say? Right. Competency of field personnel. Everyone's you know doing a good job. Some growing faster than others. Some are being challenged a little bit. When we kind of look at this in in aggregate um, in North America land on the value map, you can see JCAM Catalyst stands out as that really value advantaged supply. They've got a very strong customer base, very loyal. Um, finding well above industry average performance at, you know, attractive pricing. Champion X, very, you know, in line with the market performance overall. And obviously you see the size of the bubble there for Champion X. Baker's value, you know, being challenged a little bit in terms of its uh, value proposition. And then Halliburton, obviously a much smaller player, but also being challenged. Similar when we look at, you know, break it down a little bit further, look at some of those tier two suppliers, Notice that JCAM is the only one who's sitting in this, this bottom right-hand quadrant. A lot of people sitting very close to the median line in terms of the, the overall performance. But again, you've got to look at this from basin perspectives and your drivers. What are you trying to achieve? How are you trying to achieve it? A so, lot of variance. A lot of variance. <laughs> uh, JCAM is you know pretty consistent, quite frankly. Yeah. Um, in Permian Basin, Again, Champion X close to that median line. Baker Hughes is being challenged in that value proposition. And when I look at the Permian and I start to break it down into, you know, who's got uh, those big operators with, you know, 250 plus well programs, they're going to give a lot of their work to these big three right here, Champion, Baker, and JCAM, based upon what they're trying to achieve. Right. If I look over to the left hand side, operators with 250 wells or left, look how big that all others bubble suddenly becomes sitting right bang there in the middle of the market. So again, depending right. on your drivers, what you're trying to achieve is going to determine 
who you're going to select and who's best positioned to to go through that. Eagleford, similar story. We're seeing Halliburton sitting in the top of the Eagleford and what I would call the Southeast market, Arkansas, Louisiana, and, and Southeast Texas. Um, Baker Hughes is being value proposition challenged. JCAM sitting relatively steady. Barkin, a different dispersion paddle again. So where are you? What are you trying to achieve? Very important. When we switched international land, you know, I, I always like it when a, a value yeah. map looks like this, what we would call a well-segmented market where a lot of the service providers are sitting at or very close to the fair value fairway. Pay more, get more in the top right-hand quadrant. Pay less, get less in terms of overall performance, bottom left. But you're delivering appropriate value for your perceived pricing. Um, similarly for offshore, but the slight difference here is that Champion X suddenly pops down here as a really value advantage supplier. And we can see the competitive right. landscape changes in both of these internationally as it becomes a Baker Hughes champion and SLB conversation, whereas North America, JCAM obviously plays into the the overall equation. You know, I think, David, you know, we're, we're getting a little short on time and I know you mentioned a lot on MTBF earlier. Right. And can you share a bit more on your thoughts on how this might influence operators going about solving their mechanical artificial lift challenges? We talked about production optimization, how that can start to play into the, the equation as well. Sure. You know, in our research, based on the feedback from the oil and gas operators that we're interviewing globally, we continue to see very strong linkages, particularly in the U.S. land market, between artificial lift performance and the effectiveness or the lack of effectiveness mm -hmm. of the production chemical program. When we ask the U.S. land operators, how often does your artificial lift system fail? Mm -hmm. What failed? And, and in particular, what do you attribute to be the root cause of the failure? It's an open-ended question. What we find is very commonly the root causes for artificial lift failures are associated with some type of failure or ineffectiveness of their production chemical program, be it corrosion, So typically only about one in five to maybe one in three of the operators or less will rate the effectiveness of their chemical treatment technologies a nine or a 10. Mm -hmm. We also find that what we talked earlier with the chemical injection pumps, if they fail frequently, you're going to lose 10, 20% of runtime. Mm -hmm. And so it's very clear that there is a clear linkage, if you will, between the effectiveness of a production chemical program in solving the production chemical challenges of a well and the design of the artificial lift systems. Do you start with an ESP or a mm -hmm. gas lift or a ride pump or a plunger lift? You know, what do you start with and how do you optimize this? Now, we've already noticed in the oil and gas industry from a drilling optimization and a completion optimization that the operators realize that you can make a significant improvement mm -hmm. by driving these optimizations. Unfortunately, in the production segment, many oil companies still go about trying to solve their production chemical challenges, their mechanical challenges with artificial lift, and even their automation challenges separately. Siloed. They're siloed off in many cases. I think it's just a matter of time, and I would encourage the oil and gas operators, the linkages and the data is clearly there. It's linked. And you know, the more that you can begin to collaborate a more of an integrated approach to your production optimization, you're going to improve your, your production. And in these elevated oil prices, that's going to translate into a large value in return. So I'm just thinking about the whole life cycle for my to a, a graphic sort of ESP. I'm going to transition it to gas, transition it to rod. Here's my chemical program, that full life cycle management together holistically, and then using the data to help supplant, uh, really support that. I, I know it's a little complicated in the sense that if you add up all the choices an operator has for artificial lift and all the choices they have for production chemicals, that not every oil field service company has a broad swath of portfolio, mm -hmm. but Baker Hughes, Halliburton, SLB, they all have lift and chemicals. Yeah, Champion yeah. X has every form of lift mm -hmm. plus chemicals and automation with Xbox. Uh, Weatherford has foresight with automation. And so again, 
Each of these oil field service company suppliers have particular strengths and weaknesses. I really encourage the operators to really kind of lean forward into this, recognize there's significant upside for your companies to collaborate with your suppliers, look for these efficiencies. And just to wrap things up, Andrew, since I know we're running out of time, <laughs> what do you see for the rest of 23 and what are the other studies do are coming up between now and the end of the year? So rest of 23, I'm not going to put a bet on oil price. If I did, I'd probably be working on Wall Street somewhere. But, you know, I think the number 100 has been cited a couple of times. Look, we're, we're in a supply deficit in the, in the second half of this year. So strong oil price as a result, strong potential for those private operators to jump back Again. into the mix towards the back half of this yep. year. If not, then they're really going to have to jump back in in the first quarter, first half of next year. Okay. Um, in terms of what we've got coming up, um, Formation evaluation, uh, so that'll be Wireline, LWD, all of those reports will be coming out um, late in the fourth quarter, alongside cementing, so surface wellhead, cementing services yeah. and tools, and liner hangers. And then um, at the end of the year, we're going to be closing all of this up and providing our big integrated reports, which looks across all our products and services for the you know the major service companies across the Permian, international, and uh, North America. The big four. The big four. Awesome. Yeah. Well, I want to thank everyone for attending today's webinar. I want to thank all the oil and gas operators who participate in our research and in our industry studies. Please uh, reach out if you'd like to collaborate. We collaborate with many oil companies on a very uh, collaborative basis and glad to do it with other oil and gas operators around the world. Just reach out. So uh, thanks again, and I hope you have a great weekend ahead. Bye now.